Welcome back to Zero Sum Gaming here at the Culture Cache. This week comes to you courtesy of Zakor, one of our patrons. He wants to see Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. This is my single favorite PlayStation 2 game. So I mean it when I say thank you, Zakor, and I mean it in more ways than one. Let's check the game out. Okay, this video is going to be a bit of a gush fest. So let's just go ahead and get the negatives out of the way up front. Not that there are many. As with Solid 2, there can be some control difficulties. I don't really think it's bad, but you do need some dexterity to perform your desired actions. I think it's fine, but some people are intimidated by it. Next, the camera's a bit static. You can influence it a little, but you can't move it very much. If this really bothers you, Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence and all later re-releases of this game give you full control over the camera, so that's not a big deal. The pacing of the game is a bit uneven, with most of the narrative happening at the very beginning and very end of the game. I think it's fine since it allows the player to focus more on the action, but some disagree. Finally, Snake has an obviously bad knowledge of his own sidearm for such a renowned soldier. Observe! I lost my gun. The boss destroyed it. The boss simply removed the slide. Snake should be well versed in this very practice himself, considering that it's one of the first steps to so much as clean his 1911. The gun certainly isn't destroyed, but I digress. This is a series with a sadist who can shoot lightning from his body, multiple different cyborg ninja characters, and a nigh-on immortal bisexual self-mutilator, so that's not really all that strange by comparison. For that matter, the boss's gun, the Patriot, fires bullets in a physics-defying end-over-end manner. There. Now that the very few and minor drawbacks are out of the way, let's take a look at the wealth of good this game has to offer. As I said, this is my single favorite PlayStation 2 game, so let's see the many reasons why. First of all, check out the graphics. I know I'm going to show my age, but whatever. I fondly remember the Atari 2600. It's a lot of fun, but the graphics leave much to be desired. The graphical jump from it to the NES was almost like discovering a brand new eighth color of the rainbow. Large square pixels were replaced by actual characters and objects. Going from the NES to the SNES was another profound improvement. It's like the difference between a child drawing on a sheet of paper with a handful of crayons to a masterfully animated Don Bluth classic. And then, going from 2D to 3D graphics, appropriately, is akin to adding depth to a flat world. Granted, I generally prefer 2D games, but I'm certainly glad the option to use 3D exists. The PS1 made this popular, which is important, but it's generally pretty blocky and ugly. It's the PlayStation 2 that smooths all this out. Going from PS1 to 2 is, graphically, like going from the 2600 to the SNES. If you seriously compare screenshots from PS1, 2, and 4 games, you'll notice the PS2 looks a lot more like the PS4 than it does the 1. And that speaks volumes, considering I intentionally skipped 3 altogether. So what about this game's graphics in particular? They're excellent! so lush and detailed. When you're outdoors, grasses have multiple different heights, and believe it or not, this actually becomes a functional part of the strategy of the game. When you're indoors, reuse of assets is minimal. While it is there to a small degree, not overusing the same decorations makes each area unique. Notice I didn't say feel unique. I said unique. This too, actually affects the gameplay. In one building, maybe you hit under a bed in order to slip by the enemy soldiers, but that won't be an option in an office. The draw distance is among the highest on this system. This would be noteworthy before you consider how detailed everything is in these settings. 
it's refreshing to not see fog everywhere in the video game world. While this problem has mostly been alleviated in gaming, it was extremely common in earlier titles, especially on the N64, since enshrouding the world in low-hanging precipitation was a common way to reduce draw distances. This actually empowers your scopes, whether standalone or the ones attached to weapons. In older, more claustrophobic titles, you had these tools at your disposal, but rarely did you need them. Because each individual area can be so large now, you have to think about more than just your immediate surroundings, and this game is much better off for that. Next, let's explore the sound. As expected of the Metal Gear series, the industry-leading voice acting is flawless. These characters are deeper and more believable than many actual human beings I've encountered in real life. The full range of emotion that each actor exhibits fully fleshes out the characters. Seriously, this game is a clinic of what voice acting should be. And the sound effects are just as strong. As they say, the cream rises to the top, and this game proves it. There are so many one-of-a-kind sounds in this game, and they're not just decoration. You need to be aware of every sound you hear, and every sound you generate. If you can hear it, so can any nearby Russian soldiers. Such simple sounds as rustling leaves that are nearly always taken for granted by players become an integral part of the Snake Eater experience. Anything you do that has any impact on your surroundings becomes a potential tell that may give your position away. These traits combine to create the quintessential gaming experience. At all times, you are thrust right into the game world. Everything you do, including doing nothing at all, affects the game. Instead of players reacting to everything the game throws at them, players also cause the various actors in the game to respond in kind. This game is the single best one I can point to for successfully sucking me into its digital universe. That's not Snake on the screen running around and infiltrating an enemy base. That's me! Okay, my hair color is a little different, but that's me! Well, I'm not in my peak physical shape like Snake, but that's me! From the opening credits to the signature closing phone call, Snake's world is as real as my own. As proof, in this game, humans aren't the only adversaries you'll have to contend with. These realistic environments are teeming with appropriate flora and fauna. That alligator isn't just there for show. It can tail swipe you, bite down with immense force, or even drag you to your death by drowning you underwater. This is only one example of many. If you see or hear some grass rustling, think twice before diving into it to hide. It could be a harmless bird or bunny, but it could instead be a poisonous cobra intent on striking you. Your Cold War rivals have also set many traps with which to snare, impale, or even outright kill you, among other things. Thankfully, this is a two-way street. With all the tools at your disposal, those cute furry bunnies will be no match for you. In fact, you're going to spend a decent amount of time hunting and gathering your own food. The survival element of this game is fully realized. Under your life bar, you have another, usually longer, bar for your stamina. Almost everything you do consumes your stamina, and in turn, your stamina affects almost everything you do. For example, when swimming, your oxygen bar is exactly as long as your stamina bar. The same is true for your grip bar. As your stamina lowers, it becomes increasingly difficult to steady your aim. Should your stamina drop below half, your growling stomach easily alerts guards and animals to your presence. If you can eat, eat, then eat some more. You may never get another chance. Take another look at this game's title, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. Yep, you're going to be doing that and then some to stay alive in this game. That's tasty. Another aspect of the game that makes it all the more real to the player is the cure feature. If you get critically injured, 
you'll have to give yourself emergency surgery on the fly. You may have to extract bullets, set bones, stitch up deep cuts, burn off leeches, or any other number of things. While this system is simple, it makes Snake's injuries real to the player. Those aren't his broken bones, they're yours. It really makes you internalize his struggles. If you fail to treat these injuries, you take penalties to your max life bar. Like in Breath of Fire 3, they're temporary, but still highly undesirable. There's also the resource management angle, since your medical supplies are limited. Sometimes you can find them out in the open or in enemy infirmaries. You can also take them off the bodies of the natives. Finally, certain plants can also double as, say, digestive medicines, so you can stay stocked through your diligence and observation of the verdant landscapes you encounter. Another fun aspect of this game is how you must suit your face paint and camouflage to your surroundings. This is a little polarizing, as some players think it slows the game down. And it does, but I think the trade-off is worth it. The overall pace of this game is just a tad slower than usual already because of the stamina system and the eating requirement it imposes. I wouldn't change a thing about how the camo index works. Simply put, based on your appearance and actions, you are varying degrees of visible. This number reflects that. The higher the percentage, the harder you are to spot. A simplified version of this is carried over into Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots, but it removes player choice from the equation. It works in its own game, just as this system does in this game. Certain outfits also bestow benefits to the player, such as damage reduction or fire immunity. There are also some that are great for specific areas. The lab coat, for example, almost always sticks out like a sore thumb. But if you're in a research facility, you might be able to use it to hide in plain sight. Just remember that your actions can still give you away. Even if you're dressed as a scientist, if you're crawling around on the floor or exhibiting some other strange behavior, nobody will fall for your ruse. I truly appreciate the level of freedom you have in this game. The best way to describe it is... The answer is yes. Whenever you think to yourself, I wonder if I can finish that thought however you want. The answer is yes. While this is often true of the series, it's at its apex in this entry. You almost always have the choices of sneaking by undetected or taking out enemy sentries along the way. But even those two choices bring about countless others. How will you sneak by? Do you want to raise your camo index and blend in with your surroundings? Or maybe you'll want to disguise yourself as an alligator. How will you put down your enemies? Long range rifle trick shots? Or maybe the closeness of a handgun? Maybe your combat knife will give you the intimacy you need to get some key information from the enemy. Or you could even try something silly like throwing poisonous snakes at them. Is some dumb bastard standing under a hornet's nest? Shoot it down and watch the hilarity ensue. The fact that you can do almost anything you want in this game makes it fun every single time you play it. A large part of how this game pulls off its high level of liberty comes from its meticulous attention to detail. Early in the game, you enter a cave. It's pitch black inside, so how will you see? The most obvious answers are night vision goggles or torches, but both of these items are found inside the cave, so you're going to have to try something else, at least at first. Well, if a torch works, it stands to reason that a really small torch would still work, say, a lit cigar. This series has always rewarded the player for creative use of cigarettes or cigars, much to the chagrin of SJWs, I'm sure. And this is one of the many uses in this game. Failing that, you could also opt to wait for a while as Snake's eyes gradually adjust to the darkness. What other games even think in these terms? You can even use your sonar in the cave to trick bats into thinking you're one of them. Sometimes, these effects can even be long-term. When you come across enemy storage facilities, 
If you destroy them, then all opposing fighters nearby will be gimped. If you destroy an armory, all bad guys are limited to one magazine in each of their guns. Try taking out a food cache. Then the villainous combatant's energy levels are halved, and their complaints regarding hunger make them easy to hear from great distances. There's even a part with a hind D early in the game. Colonel, what's a Russian gunship doing here? Oh, never mind. This is Russia. Anyway, if you destroy it while it's grounded, it won't torment you later in the game. Sometimes, your outside-the-box thinking can even make boss battles ridiculously easy. Take the fear, for example. He's almost impossible to see and incredibly quick to boot. He jumps around from the treetops and rains poisoned crossbow bolts down on you. But he's not impervious. These activities drain his stamina very quickly, meaning he must pause his assault on you in order to eat. You can weaponize this against him. Like any of us, he takes the path of least resistance. He'll opt for any readily available food first. With a little foresight, you can beat him with only a single easy-to-land shot. From the start of the game, get some food, preferably meat or seafood. Now, don't eat it. Just let it sit in your inventory and spoil. When you get to this fight, throw all your rotten food in the center of the battlefield. The fear will come to eat it, but since it's rotten, it will further drain his stamina instead of refilling it. This won't completely knock him out, but it can drop him to nearly zero stamina, meaning you're only going to have to land one trank or one punch to KO him. You can use unorthodox strategies like these in many battles, actually. I won't go through all of them so you can explore and find your own fun methods, but the end is a gaming legend. Full disclosure, this is a pretty epic battle. It's a sniper duel and it takes place across three giant locations. The tension during this battle peaks start to finish. Your first time through, you should probably experience the battle as intended, but on later playthroughs, try some of these silly strategies. For example, the end has a parrot. If you capture and then later release it during battle, it will fly to him, giving away his position. Drop your Another fun alternative to this battle is to not fight it at all. You can actually achieve this in two different ways. Drop your weapon. At an earlier part of the game, in a different location, you'll encounter some characters talking, one of which is the end. If you whip out your trusty SVD sniper rifle, you can actually kill him before this boss battle, preventing it entirely. Finally, if you save and quit during this battle, and then wait for at least one full week before you resume, the end will die of old age. Details like these are why Hideo Kojima is the paragon of game design. Even after all these years, I find something new about this game literally every time I play it. Strangely, the events of this game have a parallel connection to Hideo Kojima himself now. I've really tried to avoid spoilers as much as I can, but there's no way to elude them completely. During the events of this game, Snake honorably completes his mission despite all difficulties and personal suffering. Sadly, as it turns out, he was a pawn, easily manipulated into doing horrible things in the name of his country. Even during the ending of the game, this continues as all of his strife boils down to nothing more than a presidential photo op. It's remarkably similar to how Konami all but kicked Kojima to the curb, even though he's done so much over the years to make the company what it is. It's truly distressing. If you're familiar with Hideo Kojima, you're already aware of his cinematic ambitions. Frankly, he somehow manages to make an interminably long ladder climb interesting. You can hear the main theme of the game, even though it's faint and just barely audible all while he reinforces the gameplay elements, as his multi-story ascent burns quite a lot of stamina. I touch on the film-oriented idea in my Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty video as well, but in this game, the nods to famous films are even more obvious. The espionage story already has some James Bond elements, and just in case you missed them, 
The opening makes it abundantly clear. There's also the famous scene from The Fugitive. But this game is far deeper than any movie experience ever could be. Because all of Snake's turmoil is really yours, you will care about him more than any character you're simply passively observing. We already talked about eating, impromptu surgery, there, and concealment. Any of these alone would already force you to identify with the character, well, but this game does so much more. After some rigorous torture, Snake loses an eye. If you saw that happen in a movie, you'd probably feel compassion for the character, but that would be as far as you go. In this game, from that point forward, every single time you enter first-person perspective, you'll notice the missing right part of the screen. You have a constant reminder of the animalistic brutality you've experienced firsthand. After this torture, Snake is thrown in prison. If you save and quit while in prison, something special happens. The game explains that Snake is asleep during the time between your saves. Keep in mind the horror he just experienced. Torture. Permanent mutilation, imprisonment, betrayal. When you reload the game, before it resumes, you'll actually play Snake's Nightmare. It's completely different from anything else in the game, and pretty gruesome and creepy, but incredibly revealing. We are witnessing one event of many that greatly damages the mental stability of our heroic super soldier. In the games as art debate, this game is Exhibit A. It would be moving to see these events unfold on the big screen, but when they happen to you, they mean so much more. You feel the metaphorical knife plunge into your back. You have to deal with your newfound handicap. And you have to pull the trigger. The single last moment of the game before you start the ending happens after you battle the boss. The boss is a mother figure to Snake. She's his mentor, and he clearly still cares for her, despite her Soviet defection. She's defeated, but still alive. She wants you to kill her, and you have no choice in the matter. The game simply will not advance until you execute her. Wow. In a single game, we're introduced to this phenomenal woman. We feel the pain of her Benedict Arnold turn. And then, we must carry the emotional burden of her inglorious death. And believe it or not, there's even more to it than that. You really need to experience this game firsthand. I'll not reveal it all here. Seriously, get this game. Let's engage another poignant moment from this game, the Sorrow boss battle. Up to this point, the game has been secretly storing every single enemy that you've killed and how you did it. During this battle, you'll have to atone for all of it. You will encounter everyone who has died by your hand. For example, during this playthrough, I got a little happy with the knife. And notice how many people with slit throats I have to deal with during this scene. Had I instead opted to, say, blow them apart with grenades, that would be reflected here instead. My favorite is to see the guys eaten by vultures. That's particularly grim. Another important aspect of this scene is to point out that it's not necessarily telling you, the player, that you did anything wrong. Rather, it's making the artistic point of how a man put into extreme situations reconciles the atrocities he's been forced to commit. And once again, that man is you. This game is so emotionally powerful that it's one of the few I can't finish and then immediately fire back up and play again. It makes such an impact that I actually have to decompress for a few days before giving it another go. This is literally the only game I've ever played that forces me into this reflective process, and I love the game for it. 
there is always this strangely sexual undertone to the series. It kinda makes sense, but it's still really weird. I get it. I really do, but I think it's the only part of the story that could have been done better. Still, it is important to point out, as Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain gets attacked for sexualizing quiet, it's really nothing new to this series. On a side note, Anita Sarkazian, social just us warriors, etc., to hell with you. And producers, please don't give in, any more than some of you already have, to these dumbasses who have no intention of buying your products in the first place. They're a plague and a cancer on gaming and culture at large. Anyway, the sexuality employed in this game does help show off the obvious power differential that exists. I'm not totally against it, I just think it could have been done a little bit better. Still, this is the only part of the story that's not absolutely flawless, and that's really why it stands out in the first place. This game is so very near perfect, it's not even funny. I grew up with Metal Gear. I was already in the trenches with this series before it migrated to the PlayStation. I knew I would enjoy this game based on its title alone, but it blew all of my expectations out of the water. And honestly, the series has yet to live up to the high water mark it achieved with this entry. I was already intimately familiar with Solid Snake and his tales, but this game is so well done, it managed to shift the entire focus of the series in my eyes. I now see Big Boss as the primary character, and I identify more with him than the original protagonist. Everything about this game is done so well that it's hard not to. The story is so moving and extremely well written, and the gameplay is simply amazing. When you need stealth, you have all the tools at your disposal to slink around undetected. And when it's time for action, the game delivers at every turn. Okay, is this game worth it? If you were to go check out theculturecache.com, I've got an article about this game here. It's really a character study about Big Boss. Check it out. And if you don't already have this game, there's an ad for it running on that article. You can get this game for one dollar. This game is worth a dollar many, many, many times over. But if you don't have a PlayStation 2, or maybe you just don't like the original, there are actually lots of other versions you can get of this game, and you owe it to yourself to play it in at least one of these versions. As you can see, I've already played it through multiple times myself. So you really need to check this game out. Thanks for watching. Does this Pennywise know what he's doing?